This is the third video in a series about the Quine McCluskey logic minimization algorithm. In this video, we will see how to find an optimal subset of prime implicants when the implicant table does not have any of the simplification criteria presented in the previous video. As before, I will draw parallels on a K map. Suppose we have the implicant table shown here. We can see there are six min terms and six prime implicants. If we look at the columns and the rows, we see that there are no essential prime implicants, there are no column dominance relationships, and there are no row dominance relationships. If we look at the corresponding K-map, this makes sense. So we can draw these six prime implicants. This is one, this is another, another one, one more, another and the last one. So because they intertwine in this way there are no dominance relationships and none of them are essential necessarily because another prime implicant can cover the same min term. So what do we do in such a case? Well we have to choose one of these prime implicants to be in our solution and we do this arbitrarily. In this case we'll choose P1 to be in our solution. If we choose P1 to be in our solution, we can highlight that and we can see that we can get rid of the first min term and the second min term since they're both covered by this prime implicant, by P1. On the K-map, that would be right here. This is P1, and you can see that it covers the min term 0, 0, 1, and 0, 1, 1, just like we expected right here. So now we simplify our table and get rid of these two rows and this column. Now our implicant table looks like this. And here we can actually see some useful relationships. We can see that P4, column P4, dominates column P2. And we can see that P5 dominates column P3. So therefore, we can get rid of columns P2 and P3. So this again simplifies our table. Now, looking at the simplified table, we can see some more useful relationships. We can see that P4 is actually now essential because it has a 1 in this first min term row and that's the only one and P5 is essential because of the third row with the only one here. So we see that P4 and P5 become essential after this simplification. So again we'll highlight those and their corresponding min terms. We can cross those off the table. And we see that actually we get rid of everything. And so now our table is empty. And therefore we're done. Our solution is going to be that first prime implicant that we chose, P1 and also the two that became essential after that, P4 and P5. This is our solution set. Now let's take a look at the K-map and what these prime implicants are. So we already have P1. We're also going to take P4 which is dash 1, 0 and that is right here. And P5 which is 1, 0, dash and that is this term right here. And this makes perfect sense. We see a completely non-redundant set which is minimal 
of the prime implicants. Now this isn't the only possible solution to the original problem up here. We, co we come about the solution because we chose to include P1. Well, we could have done something else. We could have chosen with the original table to include P2. In that case, we would highlight this one. Its corresponding min terms would get crossed off the table. And if we look at that on a K map, P2 is right here. And after further simplifications of this implicant table, we would find that P3 and P6 become essential as well. So this is P3, and this is P6. So now we have a new solution, which is going to be our chosen prime implicant P2 and the two that become essential, P3 and P6. So we see how we can come up with two equally good solutions by making a different initial first choice. If we want to formally explore all possible options, we would have to try to choose all of the prime implicants and see what would happen with the simplification resulting from those. In this case, it's pretty clear to see that three prime implicants is the minimum, and we reach the minimum using both of these methods, if we choose P1 or P2. In this case, had we chosen P3, well, then the table would simplify such that P2 and P6 would become essential. Had we chosen P4, then P1 and P5 would become essential, and so on. We would get these same two solutions no matter what original choice we made in the implicant table. However, for larger problems, of course, it's not so clear and the entire solution space has to be explored. My goal here is to show conceptually what happens and how we can proceed when there are no simplifying criteria in the implicant table. I do not want to show the formal techniques for searching the entire solution space and how to go about that. So the basic idea here was that if we have no simplifying criteria, we have to somehow kickstart this, and we do that by making an arbitrary choice. And that choice will further simplify things. And if we get stuck again after that choice, we make another choice, and we keep going until, once again, the entire table simplifies. In this video, we have seen how to proceed with an implicant table simplification in the case that there are no essential prime implicants or dominance relationships. There are ways to formalize this method further, as I mentioned, using techniques such as branch and bound, but I want to focus more on the concepts rather than the potentially tedious implementation of such techniques. So this concludes the series on the Quine-McCluskey logic minimization algorithm.